You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. Hello, hello, Miami Dolphin fans, and welcome to the same old Dolphin show, part of the DolphinsTalk.com podcast network. I'm Josh Katzker. With me today and every day is my brother from the exact same mother, Aaron the Brain. Aaron, say hello to the people. Hello to the people. Brain, I hope that you find yourself doing well. I'm feeling better than I was last week. If you saw me on the Dolphins Talk staff roundtable, that was a a brutal, tough night to get through. I was in pretty bad shape there. Um, But we're we're coming around. We're coming around, feeling better, starting to feel better, starting to come out of it. And one of the things that made it better, how about a Miami Dolphins victory in week one, 20 to 17 over the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Miami Dolphins. I tell you what, they're starting to come out of it too. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you said it. What what what's going to make you feel better? A Miami Dolphins victory. It wasn't the prettiest thing in the world, but a win is a win and and look, it's it's a win first and foremost. It's a win against an AFC opponent. It's a win against an AFC opponent that I think is a playoff contending team. So it's it's a big victory. A lot of people said coming into this, you know, when we were going through the schedule, this was one of the toughest games for them to pick, especially out of that early slate of games. It was like a lot of people said, well, that Buffalo game, obviously that's the easy game to give the Dolphins an L on. Um, But aside from that, if they were going to trip up somewhere else, this was the game where people could see them trip up. And, you know, it looked for about, 43 minutes <laughs> that it looked like the Dolphins were indeed going to trip up, but you got to play 60 minutes of football and the Dolphins figuring it out at the end of the day and they got themselves a dub. They absolutely did. It was, it was looking dicey for a little while there. It was, uh, it was, I was nervous at one point I was sitting there going, I, they might not come out of this. I wasn't orig- originally alarmed. Cause I was like, you know, they haven't, you haven't really seen this unit at all play together in, in any kind of meaningful action. Yeah. They've practiced together, but you haven't actually seen it in a game. And so maybe it's going to take them some time to, to ramp up and you know, whatever. But then when you got into like the second half and it was still mostly just kind of not looking great, you started going, okay, the offensive line has problems. They're having problems on the defensive line. They're not generating a lot of pressure. Uh, Trevor Lawrence is all day back there. What, what is going on? You started to, I started to get a little bit worried and then, you know, because a lot of it was problems that I think we, we foresaw, we wondered if this Dolphins interior defensive line was going to be able to generate pressure. And while they certainly did at times, there were large stretches where Trevor Lawrence had lots of time to sit back and relax in the pocket. and then. You know, one of the other things is how is this Dolphins defense going to turn out against the run? And there were some moments there where that looked pretty dicey. Um, But ultimately, they got the job done. They got themselves straightened out and they ended up 1-0. And I think that is really the most important thing is that it doesn't matter at the end of the day what they looked like in doing so because the fact is they got the win. The question becomes, is that something that they're, you know, were the things that were issues going to be issues that the Dolphins can improve upon as the season goes on? And and as I've said on this show for years and years, the the NFL is the king of, uh, it is the king of the overreaction 
to small sample size. You get a one game sample size and however things go, that is like, you know, if it's a loss, you think it's the end of the world. If it's a win, you're like, this is the best team ever. And it's like, well, hold on. You can't make assumptions on the team based on how they performed in that one game. And I think that's probably a good thing to take away, even though some of the issues I think were things that we may have expected or predicted were going to happen. So we're going to get into this game, Brain. We're going to talk about both sides of the ball for the Dolphins and, and where they performed well, where they performed not so well. We're going to get into all of that today on the show. But first, if you have not done so already, here's a reminder to make sure that you are following the same old Dolphin show on the X platform, formerly known as Twitter. That's at same old Dolphins. You can download, rate, review, and subscribe to the same old Dolphin show on Apple, Pod- Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, anywhere you get your podcast. Shout out to everybody at the I Am a Miami Dolphin Fan Facebook page. And if you have not done so already, make sure that you subscribe to the Dolphin Suck YouTube channel. Smash that like button on this video. Turn on notifications so you're notified every single time we go live. And then, of course, make sure you subscribe to Dolphins Talk Extra because if you're not subscribed to Dolphins Talk Extra, you're actually not watching this show live right now. This show is live exclusively for Dolphins Talk Extra subscribers as it will be every Monday reaction show throughout the season. Our reaction shows on Mondays are now live exclusively on Patreon. They will be available after the fact on YouTube as normal, but if you want to watch live and you want to interact with us live, you got to be a member of Dolphins Talk Extra, just like Mr. McDolphin, who is here in the chat with us tonight. Shout out, Mr. McDolphin. If you're watching on the Dolphins Talk Patreon, if you're part of Dolphins Talk Extra, give us a shout in the comments so that we know you're here watching. We see some numbers. We see that there are people there. So give us a shout in the comments so that we know that you're watching along with us. And of course, if that's something that you want to do, or you want to be part of the exclusive Discord community, or you want to get access to some of the other bonus segments and shows that we've got coming up, Make sure you subscribe to Dolphin Stock Extra, and you can do that for as little as $3 a month at patreon.com slash Dolphins Talk. And we're going to have a bonus segment today, again, exclusively for Dolphin Stock Extra subscribers immediately after the show. We're going to bounce around the NFL and talk a little bit about some of the other action that happened around the league on Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, and perhaps even on Monday night. So we're going to be talking about that in our bonus segment that is exclusively for Dolphins Talk Extra subscribers. So uh, shout out to John, who's watching, who just popped in in the chat. So anyway, that's uh, that's what's coming your way here on Dolphins Talk Extra. But Bryn, let's get back into talking about this game. Let's start on the offensive side of the ball, because this is where things started pretty slow in this game for the Dolphins. It it took them a while to get going, but when all was said and done, it ended up looking very similar to how you might expect (laughs) the the Dolphins offense to perform. They ended up putting up exactly 400 yards. Uh, They had 65 plays on offense. Tua threw for what, 300 and I'm pulling up his numbers right now. He ended up throwing, um, in the game, where did he go? Where did those? Where did his stats go? He ended up with 330 yards in the game, or 100, excuse me, 131 yards. I'm looking at the first half stat. He ended up with over 300 yards passing, 338. He had the touchdown pass to Hill. He was hitting Waddle. It, I mean, it ended up being exactly what you would expect the Dolphins' offensive performance to look like, even though it took a little while to get going, Brain. So, Brain, what was to you? the reason that it took that Dolphins offense so long to start firing on all cylinders. I think it was a combination of things as it usually is. Uh, I think first and foremost, there was rust. Um, Tyreek Hill alluded to it in the, uh, in his post game press conference. I think even Tua alluded, may have alluded to it in his post game press conference. They left some things out there um, early in the game. I mean, there was a, you know, first, was it the first or second drive of the game? You know, Tua had Tyreek deep on a throw that, you know, he usually makes. And if he makes that throw and hits Tyreek in stride, that's a touchdown. That's like a 70-yard touchdown pass. Um, granted, I think, you know, another reason why they may have struggled out of the gate was a combination of the offensive line not playing great 
because the offensive line just isn't great. Um, and you got to give the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, some credit. I mean, that front four is legitimately one of the better front fours in the entire National Football League. So we said it on the preview show, um, or I said it with Mike, is that, you know, we talked about all the concern about the offensive line, and we said, well, this is a hell of a test to come right out of the gate to have to face, you know, a, a pair of edge rushers um, in Heinz Allen and Trayvon Walker that uh, Jacksonville has, and then in the in the middle have uh, Hamilton and, and Eric Armstead coming over from San Francisco. It's about as talented a front four as you're going to see all season long. I, I Save for maybe... I don't know, Philadelphia, maybe Kansas City. I mean, it's a, it's probably a top five unit in the league as far as front fours are concerned. And you have that matchup against Miami's, you know, ragtag offensive line and it caused problems. It it meant uh, a gr an even greater emphasis on needing to get rid of the ball quickly because if, Tua didn't get rid of the ball quickly. He was very quickly in trouble. Um, and that put a strain on, okay, running backs need to pick up protection. And on that specific play uh, where Tyreek Hill is running deep, uh, I think it was Mostert. It might have been Ingold. I, I, I'd have to go back and look at it. Um, but somebody was basically having to cover and pick up a, a, a free rusher. And that was happening right in Tua's face as he lets go of that ball. And that said, Tua's still got to make that throw. Um, but he misses that throw. If that block is picked up and there's not a free rusher running right into his face and Tua can just calmly make that throw as he normally does, I feel very confident that that's like a 70-yard touchdown pass. And so little things like that, holding calls, penalties, procedural things, things just being off a little bit. Um, Durham Smythe can't catch the ball. <laughs> I mean, things like that, things like that um, are things that derailed the offense. And then in general, um, look, again, give Jacksonville some credit. We tried to run the ball. Uh, I, I think Miami came out in this with this game plan to be, we're going to run the ball on first down. And it didn't work. They weren't able to do it. They weren't able to do it inside. They weren't able to really generate it outside. They cracked a couple of decent runs outside that weren't called back on penalties. But by and large, they absolutely struggled to run the football at all, whether they tried to do it inside or outside. And part of that is the offensive line. And part of that is you give Jacksonville's defense some credit. They were all over it. Um, and so when you don't have the running game, when the offensive line's not that great and you're just off by a hair here and there, and then when you do come up with a big play, it's being called back from penalty. These are things that are recipes for disaster, and these are reasons why you go a quarter and a half or more without scoring any points. But they did eventually turn it on. I think those are all good points, not the least of which being Jacksonville. is a, It's a legit. That's a legit team right there. But the Dolphins turned it around and, <clears throat> excuse me, still dealing with this cough a little bit. They at least, they managed, <coughs> oh, excuse me, they managed oh, to get boy. the job done. <laughs> I know, I'm telling you, it's, I said I'm getting there. I didn't say I'm fully there, but, you know, listen, the season has started, so you got to you gotta fight your way through it now. Yeah, if this was preseason, you would not be doing this show. Oh, no, no. If I was preseason, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be on the sidelines with my jersey on and my sneakers. That's, that's what this would look like. But yeah, so the offense got there eventually. They they started getting it moving and, you know, eventually they got everything taken care of. Now let's talk about some of the things about the offense that worked really well. I think one of my biggest takeaways in this game, Brain, one of the things that really worked and that I was really glad to see was third and short, fourth and short. You need one yard. How many times over the last couple of years have we banged the drum about how Mike McDaniel in those situations would try to outsmart the other team and he'd try to get clever and he'd try to get cute and he'd call some sneaky play where he does this, that, or the other thing when all he has to do is just trust his team to go and get a yard. 
And I won't say that he was fully straightforward with how he did it, but having the team set up in the offset eye and having Alec Ingold as the offset back and on those third and fourth and short situations, it was third down and short situations because I don't think they, they, I don't think they converted on fourth down in this game. But on those third and short situations, snapping the ball and handing it off and letting your fullback go and get one yard. Sometimes that's all you have to do. Don't get cute. Just do it. And they did it. And they succeeded. And they kept their drives alive. And it was just like, huh, maybe it's not that difficult, Brain. Yeah, well, it, it took them the majority of the game um, because they – they did have a short yardage situation early in the game and they passed out of uh, a run look and that was a nice play call and they picked it up. And then they had another uh, third and short, third and one or third and two. I think it was a third and one um, where Durham Smythe had a, had a false start. And so that became a third and six. So that opportunity went by the wayside. Um, but it was... You know, essentially, it was was it the fourth quarter where it happened, or it, it was basically towards the end of the game. It was on their last two drives. It was a third and one in the fourth quarter, um, where they run it up the gut with Alec Ingold, and they pick up six yards, and that keeps the drive alive. Uh, and then you know they end up the drive does end up stalling out inside the red zone. Um, but they get the field goal that ties the game up. And then on the game winning drive, you know, again, third and one, Jacksonville's 40, Alec Ingold up the middle. So I think they've got something here. Um, what we know about this interior offensive line, they're going to struggle at the point of attack, particularly against bigger, stronger defensive lines. But throwing in the wrinkle of having the fullback go as a dive play as opposed to everybody keying on the the half the tailback and you know using Alec Ingold as a as a you know an extra blocker in this case it happens very it happens a lot more quicker he's a bigger guy he can move the pile if he has to and it worked for a week it worked but the most important thing is not that it I guess the most important thing is that it worked but in my eyes, it's almost more important that they tried it. Because if you don't try it, it definitely isn't going to work. And then this continues to be something the entire season. The fact that they tried it and it worked will reinforce it, will cause opponents to have to prepare for it, and we'll open up more on the outside. So if they want to get creative and they don't want to just beat their head against the wall against bigger defensive lines, this makes it easier to run on the edge or do like a little play action on those third and fourth and shorts. So the, the big thing is, is it's another ingredient. It's another piece of the puzzle. It's another layer to the offense even in a very small part of this offense, it's a very small part that was missing in a big way last season. And in the two biggest drives of the game where the Dolphins had to get points, the game-tying drive and the game-winning drive, it showed up, they were able to do it, and it's why they won the football game. It, it, that's exactly right. So it's amazing what happens when you can play just a little bit of complimentary football, when you can be just a little bit multiple. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, let's talk about some other positive contributions from the offense in this game. I, I thought that they got a little bit of something out of just about everybody in the backfield. They obviously we talked about in gold, HN, was awesome. In fact, saw more of the football receiving the ball out of the backfield. I think he ended up with seven receptions in this game. Um, but we got contributions from Raheem Mostert. And we got some very big contributions from Jeff Wilson late in the game when players were tiring. Um, to see Jeff Wilson come in and, and 
put together. Like, in fact, Jeff Wilson ended up ended the day as the Dolphins' leading rusher on the game with five carries of twenty and for a total of twenty six yards. And having those tough runs on that final drive was was really big for the Dolphins as they went to secure that game late in the end, late in, late in the day. So uh, well done. Jeff Wilson, um, some other positive contributions, obviously Tyree kill his 80 yard touchdown reception was fantastic. It took him a while to get going. He said that Tua dug into him a little bit at halftime and, uh, that kind of lit a fire in room, which you kind of love to hear that. How much of that is true? I don't know, but it was beautiful. I think the other thing that is important to learn is that that 80 yard touchdown pass to Tyree kill was not on Tua's first read. That was not the first read. That was a progression. I think his first read on that play was Waddle and he didn't have it. So they ended up, it ended up Tua held onto the ball a little bit, saw that he had Tyreek and, and hit him for the 80 yard touchdown. I mean, the pass from Tua to Tyreek was awesome. Turning that big play into a touchdown was just Tyreek being Tyreek. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, th- and I think the, the deep play, the deep throw to Waddle, also in the second half on the drive that ended up stalling and they ended up missing the field goal um, was a similar play. Um, and, and Tua talked about it in his post game presser about basically what he was doing is th- this is something that him and McDaniel worked on kind of all off season. And it's almost like they, they knew what they were getting in the first half. And, and, and this is, Look, game planning matters, and this is where you kind of have to tip your cap to the opposing defense. One thing that you noticed in this game, or that I noticed, is that everything in the first half from the Dolphins, and really all game from the Dolphins, just about, aside from maybe like a handful of throws, everything was either three yards from the line of scrimmage or less, or it was down the field. The Jacksonville Jaguars put an emphasis on taking away the Miami Dolphins' intermediate passing game. And that's where Miami, that was their bread and butter last year. And so that is another reason why the Dolphins struggled in the first half is that the Jacksonville Jaguars did a great job taking that away. They crowded the middle of the field. They dropped the linebackers deep in coverage. It was you know, not dissimilar from what San Francisco did against Miami a couple of years ago in San Francisco when everybody said, oh, they found the recipe to stopping this Miami Dolphins defense. And the Dolphins counter to that in the first half was we need to try to run the ball because they're dropping their linebackers deep. But the Jacksonville defensive line, to their credit and to the chagrin of Dolphin fans who have been calling for the offensive line to be addressed. The offensive line wasn't good enough in the run in the running game to beat their Jacksonville defensive line in their run in their run defense. They won their one-on-one matchups. And so there was not room to run. And so if you can't pass the ball in the intermediate route, you can't run the ball. It takes away so much of your offense. And so the Dolphins went to the drawing board in the second half after halftime, and they were like, all right, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to run somebody in the middle, whether it's Tyreek or Waddle, and then we're going to have another guy come up at, and run a post behind it or a, cr- or a deep crosser behind it so that there, when those guys get sucked up by the primary read, the secondary read is running open deep, and it worked. Both times it worked for those big plays. And so that is a big win for Mike McDaniel. That is a big win for Tua and is a big win for the offense because we saw this offense start to look like the offense. And it's just a reminder that, you know, you're going to run into some defenses that kind of have you figured out. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you just, you know, fold the, fold the tent and you just, you you don't have an answer. This was a good example of, you know, what have you criticized Mike McDaniel? A lot of people have criticized Mike McDaniel. Oh, when your plan A doesn't work, do you have a plan B? Do you have another pitch? Do you have another tool in the toolbox that you can go to? Well, 
I think that was an, an example of another tool in the toolbox. And then being able to run the ball up the middle on the last two drives of the game when it mattered most, well, that's another nice tool to have in the toolbox as well. Yeah, it was certainly, I think we certainly saw some improvement from Mike McDaniel in that regard. Brain, was there anything else, uh, other takeaways for you from the offensive side of the ball? Maybe the contribution of Johnu Smith and Julian Hill. Uh, any Anything there that, you know, that you want to sort of address from this offensive performance? I don't want to overreact to one game, but Julian Hill looks better than Durham Smythe, Durham Smythe to me. Um, I, I thought one of the, one of the key things Dolphins first drive coming out of halftime, or maybe it was their first or second drive. They started deep in their own territory and they ran, you know, a quick little out to the tight end. It was like, you know, one of those delayed routes, the tight end stays in and blocks and then creeps out into the flat. They ran that play twice in the first half to Durham Smythe and he dropped the ball and they threw it in the, in the third quarter to Julian Hill. And was it a big play in the game? No, it wasn't a big play in the game, but it did, you know, gain some yards. It was, it was, it was a positive play. And so, you know, it was, I, it was a six yard play. It was their first play from uh, first offensive play of the, of the second half when they were backed up at their own 13 and it got like six yards. I think Julian Hill blocks equally as good as, as Durham Smythe, but he is much more of a threat and more consistent in the passing game. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of, you know, quote unquote, two tight end uh, sets because you're going to see a lot of, the Dolphins with a tight end and then with Jonu Smith, who is going to be used as, you know, essentially a wide receiver, sometimes a running back, sometimes a more traditional tight end. I think Julian Hill should be above Durham Smythe on the, on the depth chart. But again, I don't want to over, you know, I don't want to overreact to one game one day, but this is something that I was kind of seeing in the preseason. We didn't really see Durham Smythe in the, in the preseason. And this was something that, you know, I kind of alluded to before training camp that I didn't think Durham Smythe's job was necessarily safe if if uh, Julian Hill ultimately beat him out. Um, I think the Dolphins just felt like, OK, well, we're going to be safe here. Nobody else, you know, aside from Julian Hill, you know, Jody Fortson isn't going to be able to handle the, that job. And Tanner Connor's not going to be able to handle that job. So the Dolphins kind of did it uh, in a way where it's basically like, all right, we've got two blocking tight ends and we got two receiving tight ends. But the truth about Julian Hill is that Julian Hill is a more complete tight end. He's the most complete tight end on this roster. And so I want to see more of Julian Hill than I do Durham Smythe going forward. I would say that. And aside from that, I would say the offensive line was not good. It was bad for the majority of this game. But I want to give them credit because they stuck with it. And at the end of this game, on the big passing plays that Tua had down the field, whether there were to Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, there was a lot of time to throw. And at the end of the day, when they got the game, when when they had the game tying drive and the game winning drive and they had to run the ball up the middle, the offensive line did their job. So the offensive line was bad. It was not good by any stretch of the imagination. But when it mattered most in the second half, the offensive line did play better. And so I think you do have to give them some credit. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the last thing I want to say on this offense was I really liked the utilization of Devon A. Chan being split out wide and seeing him use as a passing back. It, 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 I think I saw the stat today from Greg Rosenthal that the Dolphins had on over half of their snaps had two running backs out on the field. Um, and a lot of the time it was because they were using Devon Achan, splitting him out wide, putting him in the slot, moving him around and finding different ways to get him involved. And that is something that while they didn't have a lot of success with it, I think in this game, uh, sort of one big explosive play for Devon A. Chan. It is something that I think is going to be something to keep an eye on going forward and is going to be a way that the Dolphins are going to um, demonstrate some offensive 
flexibility and explosiveness. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I thought HN had a very good game. So brain, we're going to switch to the other side of the ball here in just a moment, but first we're going to hear a word from our sponsor. The dolphins talk.com podcast network is sponsored by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all of the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive, Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Visit Caneswear.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship it to you. International fans, too. Caneswear.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Caneswear.com. Caneswear.com. On the defensive side of the ball, Brain, do uh, you have a comment? Yeah, I was just checking uh, during the break. And just to clarify, um, I was looking at the snap counts for uh, this game. And uh, it turns out Julian Hill uh, t- was on the field for 42 snaps and Durham Smythe was on the field for 30 snaps. I'm not sure what the half by half uh, numbers were. Um, perhaps there was a there was a change after halftime. Uh, but Julian Hill was on the field for 59% of the snaps and Durham Smythe for 42% of the snaps. So uh, Mike McDaniel agrees with me. I wouldn't mind seeing those numbers skewed even a little bit more towards Julian Hill. It's something to keep an eye on going forward. But on the defensive side of the ball, Brain, I think if you're going to talk about the defensive performance in this game, you the, you have to start with the incredible individual effort of Javon Holland where he single-handedly, I think, and I don't think it's a, a it's a stretch to say this, he saved the game for the Miami Dolphins by stripping the ball out of Travis Etienne's hands, forcing that fumble that was recovered for a touchback. The, the score at that point is 17-7, I believe. Yep. It's 17-7 at that point. And if he goes in, he scores that touchdown. Jacksonville is in all likelihood going up 24 to seven, making it a 17 point game and in a game where the dolphins have struggled to move the ball. And you're now looking at, you know what you had a quarter and a half to, to climb all the way back less than that. Even this was such an enormous play and it turned the game on its head. And the very next thing that happened was to a hits Tyreek for 80 yards and a touchdown. It was just a, it was just an incredible individual effort for him to get in there, punch that ball out of ATN's hands to force that fumble. It saved the entire game and really set the tone for the final quarter and a half where the Dolphins took this game into their own hands. And it was a game brain defensively where some of the shortcomings that you worried about on this defense reared their ugly heads. But there were also some things on the defensive side of the ball that were quite encouraging. Let's start with the encouraging things. Calais Campbell, instant impact. You'd love to see it. I thought he contributed in a big way throughout the game. One of the big question marks was, are the, are the Dolphins going to get what they need out of Calais Campbell when they're relying on, relying on him to play more than perhaps he has in the past? And I thought he delivered pretty consistently in this game. Another thing that was very encouraging on the defensive side of the ball, Jalen Phillips looked good. He looked real good. And he played limited action. I think he played 30-something out of the 50-something snaps defensively. I think it was the Dolphins in this snaps, team. yeah. But he looked, he looked great. And it was like it was one of those moments where you're like, oh. Okay, maybe we're fully just getting Jalen Phillips back. And if that's going to be the case, that's one of those things, Brian, when we did our when we did our most likely paths, most likely outcomes for this team, one of the one of the things that was going to help contribute to this team having a higher ceiling was Jalen Phillips being able to come back and totally be all the way back. And I don't want to say he's all the way back, but boy, he looked pretty darn good in this one. 
Yeah, I thought he looked like Jalen Phillips. I, you know, early in the game, that's kind of where my eyes wanted to go was, all right, let's see what Jalen Phillips looked like. And even though he didn't make a ton of huge impact plays in the first half of the game, he, I think, got credit for an assist on, on the second play of the game where Calais Campbell got his tackle for a loss. Obviously, Calais Campbell got the sack on the first play of the game then got the tackle for the loss on the second play. Um, but Jalen Phillips was a big reason why he got the tackle for a loss on the second play of the game. But consistently, when Jalen Phillips had a one-on-one -on -one matchup, um, he wasn't necessarily, you know, beating his man around the corner, but he was standing up and carrying, you know, Anton Harrison back like three, four, five yards consistently. And so him showing that strength with that bull rush um, and then still looking quick and spry, um, I was really encouraged to see what he looked like and then to have it come to fruition and come up with a sack late in the game, in the, you know, the biggest time in the game. You love to see it from Jalen Phillips. I think we're only going to see him get better and better as, you know, he gets more into the swing and more into game shape because you can't really simulate uh, game speed. And it's been, you know, since Thanksgiving night uh, of last season uh, that he was on the field. But I thought Jalen Phillips played a hell of a game. Um, I thought Emmanuel Ogba did, did a nice job. I think Emmanuel Ogba is going to be Emmanuel Ogba. Um, he's going to get some sacks when some guys from the outside, uh, generate some pressure and they kind of fall into his lap, but I think he was strong at the point of attack. Um, I thought he did a nice job, but I thought David long, um, was probably, well, obviously Javon Holland was, a, was the best defender on the, on the field. And that one play, you know, that saved the game, the peanut Tillman punch, uh, of the of the ball, um, I mean that changed the entire outlook of the game. I mean, you said it it looked dicey, and there were times where you where you said, "Well, I I don't think the Dolphins are going to get up from this." Well, I think that was the feeling when Travis Etienne was running into the end zone, and it looked for sure that the Jaguars were about to go up twenty four to seven, and. Javon Holland punching that football out changed the entire outlook of the game. The fact that the Dolphins were able to score a touchdown on the 80-yard bomb uh, catch and run to, to Tyree Kill on the next game, that two-play swing, that was the entire, that was the biggest turning point of the game. There's no doubt about that. So obviously, Javon Holland gets credit for that, and he was all over the field, and that was great. But I also think David Long stabilized this defense. He was all over the place, making tackles. Um, just, you know, it's we saw it at times last year, but this was a real good game for David Long, so I want to give him his flowers as well. Um, I also, like, you know, this is a pro Storm Duck podcast, right? This, this podcast is extremely pro Storm Duck. Not that it was the biggest impact play of the game, but Storm Duck got in there and made a hell of an open field tackle in the second half of this game. He, he sure did. And let's not let's not also sidestep the fact that he started ahead of Ethan Bonner in this game. Also true, which I thought was also, you know, a very interesting development. And, you know, I, I don't know that there's much reading into. The fact is, is that he's higher on the depth chart is, than Ethan Bonner is. I would say, what is that? You know, you could read into it as you like, but I don't know how much you could read into it. I mean, at the end of the day, one I guy. Say, you know what you can read into it? It's duck season, wabbit season, duck season, wabbit season, duck season, wabbit season, wabbit season, duck season. Thank you. How about that? A Looney Tunes throwback on the same old dolphin show. That's the kind of content that you, you you come to expect from us. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. Brain, um, so the defense, they certainly had their moments, but there were also some things in this game that I think were a little bit worrying on the defensive side of the ball. There were certainly some moments where Jordan Poyer looked old. There were a couple moments where uh, Jalen Ramsey looked like maybe he had lost a step. 
Um, the interior defensive line was struggling to pressure Trevor Lawrence at times in this game. I don't want to say these are things that I'm worried about necessarily, but they were things that I think we both saw as possibilities this year that we thought maybe were perhaps on the, I don't know if they, we thought they were more likely than not, but they were certainly things that we were worried about seeing. And now they are things that we have in fact seen through the first game of the season. I'm a little worried to, I, I, like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like Jordan Poyer pay, played a hundred percent of the snaps. Um, there are things that Jordan Poyer brings to this defense that the dolphins didn't have last year. There's a leadership, there's a toughness, there's a stability. There's a floor. There's a high floor of play there, but Jordan Poyer is not the Jordan Poyer of three, four years ago. He's not this super athletic guy. And so when you say there were times that Jordan Poyer looked old, yeah, that's because Jordan Poyer's old. Now, and I don't think that there's, the fact is, is that you compare it, you, you say, well, there were times where Jalen Ramsey looked old. And I would say that's concerning, but I'm willing to overlook it considering there was talk of a hamstring injury and he was like a game time decision and all of that. And they signed this, you know, big contract for him. Although if anything, that kind of makes me a little bit more worried is that like, well, did you just give a bunch of money to a guy who is about to hit the wall because of his age, because we've seen defensive backs of his age hit that wall. I would say this about Jalen Ramsey, Jalen Ramsey, because of his length, and his physicality and his his mental aptitude, this is a guy that can be moved all over the field. And if you wanted to, you could play it. Like if Jalen Ramsey hits the, the, the cornerback wall, well, you can do what, you know, a lot of great cornerbacks have done, what Rod Woodson did, what Charles Woodson did. And this guy could end up being an all pro safety. I'm not saying he's there yet, but if push came to shove and you were worried like, all right, he's lost a step and he can't play corner the way that he used to play corner. Well, he could still play safety as good as anybody in the league. And the fact that he's coming off of a hamstring injury, I'm going to let this thing go. I'm going to say, all right, well, let's keep an eye on it, but I'm not going to freak out about it. I'm concerned about Jordan Poyer because look, this was the case last year. Jordan Poyer, the, the, the book on him out of Buffalo was, this is a guy that's kind of hit the wall. He's lost a step. He can't really play deep safety anymore. That's why he was playing a lot in the box. And so I think this is something that we're going to have to keep an eye on um, as far as Jordan Poyer, especially if he's going to be playing 100% of the snaps. Um, I think I'm, I am concerned about that position on this defense. Brain, one of the big questions coming into the season about the Dolphins defense was how is Zach Sealer going to perform in the absence of Christian Wilkins? So my question for you is how did Zach Sealer perform in the absence of Christian Wilkins? I think he had a solid game. I think Zach Sealer is a solid defensive tackle. I don't know that he's an all pro. I don't think he is. Um, but I think he's a really solid defensive tackle that, I think at the money that you're paying him, the value is right. But he's not Christian Wilkins. He's not a game wrecker. Um, there aren't going to be very many games where you say, man, Zach Sealer was really just an absolute terror in that game. And the few games that he had last season that were like that, I think, you know, look, Zach Sealer's a good player. He deserves his credit. Um, but a lot of that is the fact that him and Christian Wilkins played so well together and that Christian Wilkins is such a terror on the inside that he draws so much of that attention. And so now Zach Sealer uh, is not going to have that same success. The other thing is, is that it's not the same defense. Like the, the truth of it is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of times they're playing these three man fronts uh, where Benito Jones is the, you know, is the nose and, 
you know, either Benito Jones or Brandon Peely. And, uh, you know, Benito Jones got eight snaps in this game and Brandon Peely got five snaps. So it's not like, you know, that they played like a nose tackle every single play. But, you know, Zach Sealer at his best is not, you know, a 3-4 defensive end. He can do it because he can occupy blockers and he can do his job and he can do the dirty work there. But Zach Sealer really at his best is a 4-3 defensive tackle. And so I think when the when the Dolphins were at their best, um, it was, you know, I, I don't know that they really generated much pressure off of the interior defensive line, but I don't know that that was necessarily the game plan. I think the game plan is for those interior defensive linemen to take up as many blocks as possible and give space to Jalen Phillips. And, you know, uh, eventually it will be Chop Robinson and Bradley Chubb and, you know, Mo Kamara and, and, you know, all the edge rushers on this team. So I think, look, if you're expecting Zach Sealer to go out there and put up numbers like Christian Wilkins put up last season, you're going to be disappointed. Zach Sealer is going to do a lot of dirty work for this team. Um, but I, and I think he'll do it effectively, but I think it's going to be largely uh, kind of a thankless job. It's going to be a lot of dirty work for this team. Any other defensive takeaways? for you from this game brain before we hit on some odds and ends i think um miscommunications um you know the third and eight play on jacksonville's second touchdown drive um Cr christian kirk running free right up the seam i mean he's the team's best receiver and he's running wide open in the middle of the field on a third and eight that's a blown coverage I mean, that's that's a situation where they're going to look on film and they're going to figure that out, what well, you would hope. So these are things that need to be cleaned up, and these are things that happen when you're talking about learning a new defense. Um, and then on that same drive, you know, the touchdown pass to Brian Thomas, um, it looked like there was miscommunication, miscommunication on the back end between Jordan Poyer and Jalen Ramsey. So I think those things need to get cleaned up um, but by and large, if you look at this, this, I mean, first off, you look at the total numbers, the defense ended up having a whale of a game. Um, they, they held Jacksonville to what, like 267 yards, uh, you know, of total offense, um, as far as, you know, third down conversions, uh, Jacksonville was what, like two for 10. So, I mean, the defense was getting off the field. Uh, it was just, it was a few drives. It was a handful of drives. It was, you know, I said in the, you know, the, the first quarter, the difference in the first quarter was Tua missed a deep throw to Tyree Kill. And on a deep throw uh, that Jacksonville had, Jalen Ramsey had an obvious defensive pass interference. You know, in the second quarter, it was the miscommunication on the third and eight play to Christian Kirk. And then the apparent miscommunication on the touchdown to Brian Thomas. And then, you know, obviously there were questions like on that, you know, Jacksonville's first touchdown drive, they were able to run the ball effectively against Miami. And so that's obviously a concern. I think that's going to be probably my biggest concern because I assume if they clean up the, the miscommunications, what you're left with is my biggest concerns are Jordan Poyer being old, and that being something that can negatively impact this Dolphins secondary. And just in general, can the Dolphins be staunch against the run, whether it's interior, whether it's on the edge? Um, those are my big concerns from this defense. But overall, at the end of the day, they ended up having a hell of a game in the, the second half of this game. Granted, it looks a lot different if, J if Javon Holland doesn't punch that football out. But he did. And so when you look at this thing, big picture wise, the defense ended up having a pretty good game. So you can't be too angry about it. Yeah. I mean, they did end up allowing 128 yards on the ground on 26 carries. So that's almost five yards per carry. Um, but at the end of the day, they also, they got that big play and they came away with the victory. So it turned out to be a good day when all was said and done for your Miami Dolphins. Uh, some odds and ends. Uh, I don't know where Jake Bailey had been hiding that leg, but uh, he was out there 
delivering some great punts. Uh, Jason Sanders looked very good with the, ex- with the exception of the field goal where he slipped. He had a foot slip, so he missed the one field goal uh, fairly badly. But hitting a 50-something yarder to win the game for the Dolphins, that's pretty good. Um, just all around, I think, you know, there, there are little things here and there. Brain, any other little bits and bobs that you want to mention here before we check our pulse? Penalties got to get cleaned up. Nine penalties for 103 yards. Yeah, you had a big penalty for the pass interference, and that's, you know, that's going to happen here or there, and that's a big chunk of the yards. But to still have eight other penalties, to have, I think, three holding calls, um, three or four holding calls, um, these are things that got to get cleaned up because, uh, you know, these, these those are drive killers. Uh, those are those are going to be the difference in winning and losing some football games. They almost cost you in this game because, look, let's face it, the Dolphins got off to a really slow start. And if not for Javon Holland's heroic play of punching that ball out of Travis Etienne's hands, I don't know that they're going to have enough firepower to come back and win this football game if they're down 24 to seven and we'd be going back and we'd be looking at the first half of this game. And we'd be looking at a lot of those drives that got, you know, stalled out because of penalties. Um, And and so I I think the penalties obviously have to be cleaned up. So we'll talk about, we'll talk about all of that stuff. We're not, we're going to end up not doing a Buffalo preview show this week because the game is on Thursday night, but we'll have you covered here at the Dolphins Talk Podcast Network. So stay tuned on the channel. Lots of other lots of other programs. We'll, we'll get a lot of coverage on that game. We'll be reacting to the game. How about this? How about Friday morning, same old Dolphin show live on the Dolphins Talk YouTube channel. Coming up this Friday, we will be reacting to the Bills game live, and it'll be a Friday morning affair. Exactly where that show is emanating from remains to be seen. It could be from a hotel room in Virginia. could be from a bagel shop in Virginia. Who knows? But we'll be coming to you live on Friday morning, reacting to the Buffalo game Thursday night. But Brain, we've, we've talked about it. It's now time to check our pulse. Let me check your pulse if you're not fired up. Once again, for a Dolphins Talk Pulse Check, this is where we ask you for one word to describe how you are feeling right now about your Miami Dolphins. What is one word following that victory over Jacksonville brain that would describe how you were feeling about the Miami Dolphins right now? So it's not an emotion, but it sums up what this game was and it was ugly. And I don't know that that's a bad thing for this team because this is a team that last year won a lot of pretty football games. And when things got ugly, it didn't usually go the way that we wanted it to go. There were some games where they got off to some ugly starts and then it got really pretty really quickly. But there weren't very many games where the Dolphins really had just adversity throughout and were able to overcome. And this was the case for this game. The Dolphins trailed in this game for Almost the entirety of the game. They tied the game up in the fourth quarter and then they took control of the game and they won it with the game on the line. Um, And so for me, it's not a bad thing. I don't know that it's necessarily a good thing because you'd like for the team to play better. But the truth of the matter is, is that the team's not always going to have their A game. And the sign of really good football teams is that when they don't have their A game, they still find ways to win. And this team still found a way to win, and it was a big game, and it's a game that at the end of the season, you might look at look at and say, 
That's the difference between us making the playoffs and not making the playoffs. That's the difference between us winning the division and not winning the division. That's the difference between us hosting a home playoff game and not hosting a home playoff game. And at the end of the day, if that's what the case is, that could be the difference between you winning a playoff game and not winning a playoff game. So, yeah, I thought this was ugly, but you know what? An ugly win is still a win, and I'll take it every single time. We'd love to see it. Ugly. Let's take a look. We asked some of the folks on the X platform, formerly known as Twitter, what their words were. Ian Carter says, pleased. Jason, relieved. David Jappy, hypertension. Broward Bread uh, from Rags to GP says, lucky. T underscore Hutch says, relieved. Chris Buston, stunned. Trevor, detained. Joe Wiles, uneasy. Dante Xavier, relieved. Uh, UC Funke, lunky. Jordan Murray, hopeful. Dan says, resilient. And all of those are excellent answers. And in fact, several people shared. My, well, we've got Mr. McDolphin here in the chat, still watching live with us on Dolphin Suck Extra, says, hopeful. Um, I'll tell you, mine, relieved. Because losing this game, I you know, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been a disaster in terms of like the season. It just would have put a lot more pressure on the Dolphins to win one of those other games, you know, those other games in the season coming up. But, you know, for a team that has thrived on stacking wins early in the season to sort of build up a cushion for themselves, this game has been was hugely, hugely important. And having gotten off to such a slow start, such an uncomfortable start, to see them turn it around and get the win, a big win, which we may eventually find out that this is a win over a very good Jacksonville Jaguars team. You never know. This may be one of those quality wins come the end of the year. And it's a big one because it sets you off on the right foot. And it also means that you're not 0-1 preparing to face off with a 1-0 Buffalo team in your own house the next week. And, you know, obviously it's early in the season, but you wouldn't, you know, the idea of being 0-2 with a loss to Buffalo in hand is, you know, not great. So the fact is that you're not having to deal with that possibility now. Now you're going into that game at 1-0. You got the win. You got a win in a game where you didn't play your best, which is awesome. So at the end of the day, like many of the people that responded, I'm relieved. I'm relieved that the Dolphins got this win and have started the season 1-0. and And now we can move on to week two and a big game against the Buffalo Bills. If you have one word to describe how you're feeling about the Miami Dolphins right now after that win over Jacksonville, let us know in the comments on this video. Let us know. Tweet at us. I'm on Blue Sky. At Amplified to Rock, you can follow the brain. At Aaron the Brain. At Samuel Dolphins, of course. Let us know. Let us know. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Man, I'm telling you, this, this cough is, is brutal. And this cold is just. It's it's hanging in there, but I'm fighting it. I'm fighting hard, folks. I'm fighting you got to be resilient. I got to be resilient. I need to not just be relieved. I need to be resilient. So we're going to wrap it up here for this one. We are going to go into our bonus segment. Again, if you were a Dolphins Talk Extra subscriber, this bonus segment is for you. And we're going to be talking about some of the other things that we took away from week one in the NFL from around the league, including perhaps some of the Buffalo Bills. And our thoughts about that. So we're going to be talking about that in our bonus segment. If you're not a Dolphin Sock Extra subscriber, you can go to patreon.com slash Dolphin Sock and become a subscriber for as little as $3 a month. We hope you'll consider doing that. But otherwise, we make sure that you are that you review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, anywhere you get your podcast. Make sure you're visiting DolphinsTalk.com each and every day. It's your one-stop shop for all things Miami Dolphins. And we will be back with you Friday morning talking about reacting to dolphins and bills and we're looking forward to that one because that's going to be a big game thursday thursday night the first amazon game of the year looking forward to it but until then take care of yourselves and each other and as always oh my god i've, I've got my doubts about pulling this off but here we go go
Welfare. <laughs> Did Tyrell, did Tyree Kill actually say that he wanted to be a cop? 